This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. My guest today is Don Bentley. Don is a former U.S. Army Apache helicopter pilot who flew as part of the QRF, the Quick Reaction Force for Operation Red Wings the mission that is chronicled in Marcus Luttrell's Lone Survivor and in Peter Berg's movie by the same name. This is a perspective that I hadn't heard before, and I think it is probably the most emotional uh, and powerful podcast that I've done to date, even though it was recorded back in November of 2019. You'll notice that the video cuts out close to the end and switches over just to audio. Um, but that's because I set up the camera and uh, didn't quite know what I was doing. But uh, I listened to this podcast again, and that's something that I haven't done yet. Usually I just record and uh, send them off and then they get uh, posted. But this one, it had been a while. And I remember how emotional it was um, to, to talk through Operation Red Wings and Don Bentley's um, uh, participation in that QRF as a helicopter pilot. So I listened to it again and uh, it just it just blew me away. So Don, thank you so much for sharing this story. Um, it means, uh, man, it's just, a, it's a powerful one. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, Don is also an author and he is the author of the Matt Drake series. The second one right here, The Outside Man is available now. The third in the series is coming out this May, Hostile Intent. You can go to donbentleybooks.com to check out more about what he has going on and then follow him on the social channels from there as well. He is also continuing the Jack Ryan Jr. series, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan Jr. series, the first one of which Target Acquired is out now, and there are more from Don Bentley on the way. So Don, thank you so much for your service to the nation. And thank you so much for spending time with me here on Danger Close. So now without further ado, Don Bentley. Don Bentley, what's up, man? Hey, how, how is it you? going, Jack? Carr? It is great to be here with you at BoucherCon. At BoucherCon. So we're in Dallas. Yes. And uh, this is a what do we call this? It's a uh, mystery, suspense, thriller, writers, readers, fan conference. That's a lot of sort. words. It is a lot. It is that. Yes. Yeah. yes. You could just say writers conference. Writers too. conference. Yeah. I don't feel could, like that captures it. Though. No, not the entire essence. Yeah. Definitely not. No, this is a, it's a great place to come and uh, and uh, interface and talk to other mm -hmm. authors, have a few drinks, share some stories, build Absolutely. you know build those relationships and stuff like that very naturally. Yeah, so it's a very cool, uh, cool thing to do, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, me as, me as well. It is, it is funny, you know, doing every talk. Everybody talks about writing be a solitary gig, and I think that's partially true. But I think the other part we were, you and I were talking beforehand, is there, there's that whole like journeyman apprentice thing that goes along with writing, not just from the craft perspective, but hey, I got my first contract. What do I do next? What do I? And that's what I feel like the people here and at Thrillers best are so giving with their experience and time, time and stuff. And, you know, we'll sit down, New York Times bestselling authors will sit down and walk you through, this is how my career, and you don't, you know, where else are you going to get that? It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I did not expect that coming into this, uh, you know, we both have a similar background, both mm -hmm. made transitions yep. um, out of the military. And I thought that when I showed up and really I probably whatever I was going to get into, but I knew that, that uh, my passion was writing and this is mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. Yep. But I thought other authors would keep me at arm's length yeah. and not be helpful. Look at me yep. as competition. Uh, I just thought that's how the world yep. would work. Yep. And the exact opposite has been true. Yep. And yep. everyone I've met has just welcomed me with open arms, been so kind, generous with their time, yep. their advice. And uh, yeah, so I, I think we're in a very special uh, profession. Right it here, really is. supports one another. It really is. And I feel like the this is my first voucher con. I've gone to Thriller Fest a bunch of times. But I feel like with both of those, the folks who are the uber successful writers kind of set the standard for it. And so when, you know, with Thriller Fest, Lee Child walks around, he doesn't have any handlers, he doesn't have any people, you bump into him. And so if you ever get too big for your britches and you say, well, there's Lee Child and he's rubbing elbows with everybody and he's oh, talking yeah. to folks. And I, I feel like like that from the top down sets the tone for these conferences and says, hey, you know, if I'm Mr. or Miss Successful Writer, and I have time to talk with a newbie like me or, or you or something, 
then certainly everybody else should too. And it, and it has been fantastic that way. Yeah. Lee Child's been amazing to me. David Morell is here. Yep. Like all yep. these guys are just so giving of their time and, uh, you know, as mentors Absolutely. To, to the next, uh, next generation coming in. And, you know, let's talk a little bit about that. So yeah. bring me, so we've met a few times before, yep. Yep. but, uh, and that's why I love this podcast. So it gives me an excuse <laughs> to sit down and ask you all these questions and hang out and have a conversation together. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I'm super excited about it. So sure. bring me back and, uh, take me through your, bring, bring me into the military yep. and then out of the military and then into this, uh, into this professional sure. writing. So I was, I went to school at the Ohio State University on a uh, Army ROTC scholarship and I had known um, probably much the same way as, as you had known from an early age that I wanted to serve and, and wanted to uh, go in the military. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. And I was also, as, as a young kid, I loved writing. I loved, um, I, I wanted to be, uh, I think, a novelist for about as long as I could remember. But we really wasn't sure how that worked, like how the mechanics of it work. How do you get from writing a scene to actually putting a book together? And I'm, I'm probably the only guy in the history of Ohio State that got accepted as a poli-sci major and switched to electrical engineering. So I was, wow. I was that guy because I, I had this you know, thing where I wanted to write and everything. But at the same time, I, I was in the back of my head, even then, I guess, kind of practical thinking, you know, it's, it's probably easier to be an engineer who's trying to write a book on the side than a struggling writer who's trying to pay bills on the side and such. <laughs> and so it was funny in college, my, my senior year of, of school, um, all the engineers had to take this engineering writing class, a technical writing class. And, uh, the first assignment was kind of a softball and the professor's like, Hey, just write about something you built. That's, that's it. And so all of my classmates wrote about circuit boards or what engineers should write about that they built. And I wrote a funny story about a treehouse I built when I was a kid and, and wrote that. And, That's awesome. And yeah. And, and so the next day, the professor stands up and he's like, hey, I don't normally do this, but one of your guys' paper reminded me of being a little kid and, and building a treehouse. And so I'm going to read it to you. And he read it in my paper. And that was like my proudest moment of college. And I'm like, I've majored in completely the wrong thing. Like this, oh, is, wow. this is, and then not, not seriously to that extent, but it still had kind of that, that bug for me. And so I was fortunate enough, um, to get aviation and, and went and became an Apache pilot, which is an awesome gig. Well, don't gloss over that. Cause, uh, <laughs> I was just talking to Tony Tata, Brigadier General. He glossed over. I planned some, uh, invasions of countries and I was like, well, let's, maybe we should go, maybe we should go revisit that, but I'll save that for the next one I do with him. But, uh, so how does that work? How does becoming an Apache pilot? Work? So it is, I'll say up front that it is hard to have a bad day when you're an Apache pilot, because it is when, when there was a time when I was a young Lieutenant and then uh, a captain where I thought, you know what, if I could just fly one day a week, I would do this for the rest of my life. Like, I can't believe they actually pay me to do this. And so you go after, um, after your commission, you go to Fort Rucker for flight school and it, and that lasts about a year. And then you do your transition into whatever your advanced aircraft is. And so what's pretty funny for flight school is that the very first day they invite all the spouses to come and it's kind of like an orientation to the army. Cause we're all young second lieutenants and, and, uh, the, the captain who's the instructor gets up and says, okay, for you spouses, we're going to give you a test and you're going to take it. And based on the results of that test, we're going to be able to tell you what your spouse is going to fly. And I was like, oh, that's pretty interesting. And so the, 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 they go through it and they said, okay, if your spouse is extremely detail oriented, if they're very precise, if they're and kind of go through these things and they say, well, they're going to be a Blackhawk pilot. And then they go down. And the last thing they say is if your spouse lights things on fire and likes to blow <laughs> things up and everything, he or she is going to be an Apache pilot. And my wife looked at me and I'm like, that's it. That that's is it. what I want to do. Nice. And so, um, once you finish flight school, then you go into the transition and the Apache one was one of the longer ones because you, you're, you're learning both to fly the aircraft and, uh, to fight the aircraft. And then the Apache is, is very, very unique in that the, the system that you use to fly at night is a, um, an IR system and it only goes through one eye. And so you, you actually have a monocle that fits over your right eye and you have to learn how to fly looking outside in your right eye and then use your left eye to see the instruments inside the cockpit. 
And so the way they teach you to do that, it's called fly in the bag. And so they literally take garbage bags, black garbage bags, and coat the um, back seat with that so you can't see out at all. And then the instructor sits in the front seat and you fly during the daytime and it forces you to use only your right eye and to fly. And so it works. It's really, really a hard thing to master. But what it makes it harder is you're concentrating so hard on just flying out of that one eye and only looking at the right eye. And what will happen is when you're usually when you're on short final and you're sweating and you're concentrating so hard because you can barely keep it together, there'll be a pin prick in one of those black bags and this little shaft of light will come in and it'll take over and all of a sudden your left eye will take over and, you, wow. and you're like, ah, what is going So you're, you're like squinting or trying to close it back down to do that. And so that's, that is probably the hardest part in, in the part of that transition that most folks, um, find the hardest, the, 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 the part that is the most fun is when you get to go shoot your first gunnery. And so nice. you have, Where do you do that? So you, you, they have, um, pads to do it at, uh, Fort Rucker. You get to shoot guns and rockets. You don't get to shoot, uh, hellfires till you actually go to their, your unit. Cause it's so expensive. But <laughs> the first time you shoot that 30 millimeter cannon and it's, you know, it's right under the aircraft and it shoots and it's like your chest is getting thumped and it's like this jackhammer and the whole aircraft shakes and you're like, this is the best job in the world. Like, wow. and, and, uh, like I said, so super hard to have a bad day uh when you're being an apache pilot and so i did that um did you start what do you what what airframe do you start on do you have to get like a regular pilot's license first yeah. and then go to a helicopter so that's, that's like a, a trainer question. and yep. then go on to the apache like, yeah what, what, so, what, when do you get to, what how many things do you have to work your way through to get to in that apache seat so you fly um you, when you start flight school you you fly a uh, what's called the th-67 or at least back then which is kind of like a jet bell ranger so it's a, a trainer and you do what's called primary um, where you're learning how to hover and how to do basic helicopter stuff. And it's actually... You start with helicopter. You don't yeah, get a little... Yeah, like, yeah, You start okay. straight with helicopter. And it's pretty funny because um, uh, the way it works is you have... You, we can call them stick buddies. So it's it's you and your fellow, you know, whoever you sit next to that you're paired. And, and so you have one instructor for two students. And so what happens is that you both jump in the helicopter. One of you flies. The instructor sits in the other seat. And you fly out to these staging areas that have little runways and stuff all over Alabama because there's so many helicopters they want you to have kind of your own one and so your stick buddy hops out you fly and then you switch seats and and so the the part everybody loves watching is when you're trying to learn how to hover the first time and so you will literally like pull up seats out in the grass and watch your buddy over there trying to hover in the helicopter sliding all over God's creation and the the instructor pilot taking the controls before you crash into the ground every time. And so wow. there comes a point where you finally hover and it's, and it's not, um, skill on your part. It's usually that you're putting so many control inputs into the helicopter at the same time. It can't figure out what to do and it kind of settles wow. there. And so like for one magic moment you've hovered and you were like, Oh my God, I'm hovering. And then it usually you lose it and it starts to slide away. And so you actually get this hover card that you can, you can show that you have officially <laughs> learned to hover at that awesome. one point. And so you do primary first, still in that TH-67, that Jet Bell Ranger, and then you transition to instruments. And that's where you, you learn how to fly uh, via an instrument. So it's all in the clouds. It's all, um, you're not doing any of the stuff you were before. Now you're just learning how to fly by instruments and then the last and then you go from there to what's called basic combat skills and so you switch helicopters again when i went through in the army as i'm sure the navy is too is very cyclical where they will do something for a while and then it'll come back so the way they did it for us is you would stay in that you'd switch to an oh 58 so again an, an alpha charlie an older still kind of jet bell helicopter and um that's when you first learn how to employ the helicopter tactically so now you're learning how to actually navigate from a map and, and using um, just stopwatches and headings and adjusting for winds and how do you find an LZ and how do you use the terrain, the mask, and how do you do nap of the earth and everything. So it's, no GPS. You're no all, GPS, okay. no instrument. So it's literally all the, the night before. You're, so your, your instructor pilot will say, okay, here are the four landing zones or something we're going to hit. And so you've made all these maps and you sit there and plot out um, – all the asthmas and stuff and and you write the times out and there's this whole as I'm, I'm sure you know and you've flown with the 160th and stuff but there's this whole mentality in in rv 
Army Aviation, the, the 160th is the cream of the crop. And they t- say that it's plus or minus 30 seconds every time. That's what they hit, right? And so that's what you're, you're trying to struggle for is that I'm going to fly these multiple r- legs and then still hit the LZ at plus or minus 30 seconds, right? And except for you're trying to do it all just by compass dead reckoning stuff. Wow. And so you, that's how you're learning how to account for winds and for, and, and frankly, to navigate because, you know, navigate, obviously navigating on the ground is, is one separate skill. Navigating while you're flying at 120 knots off the treetops is a completely different skill. And so you actually, the way they teach you is you start out higher so you can see more terrain features and kind of do it. And then you slowly get lower and lower till you're doing nap of the earth off the trees and stuff and doing that. And then once you're done with that phase, then you progress to nights. And so then that's the first time you're given goggles, nods, and, and actually learning everything. And, and so you're basically repeating that basic combat skills, but now it's all at night and you're doing that. And so once you finish all of that, that's when you get your wings. And then from your wings, it used to be that you transitioned to your advanced aircraft, which is either, um, it used to be OH-58 Deltas, but they've taken those out, Apaches, Blackhawks, or Chinooks. Now, I think they have, like I said, the cyclical part is what they started seeing is that young second lieutenants and warrant officers have very few hours in their actual aircraft when they come out into the Army because you're going through flight school in a different aircraft. And so there's a toss-up. Uh, with it because the, you know, I think the Apache costs something like $1,500 a flight hour in order to fly. And a TH-67 is about 200. And so it's much more cost effective to do it in a cheaper helicopter. But then you have guys and girls coming out who don't have a whole lot of experience in their actual aircraft. And so I think they went back to about the basic combat skills um, part, doing your designation there for an aircraft and switching you off. But it's, it's a huge deal because when you, when you graduate, there are not, as, as the military often is, what you want and what is actually available do not entirely align. And needs so, of the Navy, son. Exactly. <laughs> needs of the Army. Yeah. Absolutely. And so you, all through flight school, there's an order of merit list and you're, you know, checking your rank and how you do it. And so you're, you know, you're praying that either you're, you're far enough up on the order of merit list that you get to pick what aircraft yeah. you actually want or that the needs of the army happen to align with, with, yours. with yours. Yeah. Because there's nobody will admit to it, but you, you certainly don't want to graduate from flight school and then have to fly a black Hawk if you always wanted to be a gun guy. Right. right. There's, and so I was very fortunate that the stars aligned there and I got to fly um, Apaches afterwards. So, so you're there and you get the, uh, okay guys, here you go. Yes. Come up and check your assignments. Everybody yes. goes and looks at the board you're like, and you're yes! like, boom. And so you see, so what are your options? You're, you're Apache, but then where are your options to go? What units? Um, so the units, that's a good question. Or what I, did you do? So the, what, so what happens is after you go through, um, and more importantly, did they pound those wings in when you got them? <laughs> we did not get blood wings. No? We're aviators. We're kinder, gentler, softer <laughs> people. Um, got it. Noted. I, it noted. Yeah, exactly. I think what happened is because there's a separate phase two that's the officer basic course. So after you do the flight school sp- part, then you do the, I'm actually going to learn how to be an officer. And so you, you're broken down into groups. You have lift guys, attack guys, scout guys, and you're in these different groups. And so over a period of months at the very end of flight school, is where you're going through and learning how do you write op orders? How do you doctrinally, because the, the Army is different than how the Marine Corps employs aviation in that in the Army, aviation is, is its own maneuver branch. And so you, you actually are learning doctrinally, you know, how does that work? What is, you know, what is my job as an aviator? What are, you know, the Apaches, my first uh, assignment out of flight school was in South Korea. And back then, doctrinally, what Apaches did was go cross flot or cross the forward line of troops. And your job was to go find the, the second echelon or rear echelon forces that were going to be coming down and reinforcing the front lines and take those out. And so there was a whole lot of training on what is, you know, what does the order of march look like? What are the, the vehicles um, yes. that you should be looking for? So, so there's a whole lot more, and I don't certainly don't mean to, to minimize what the Marines do, but for them, their attack aviation is always employed in support of their ground forces, right? So they, so Cobras are coming in over their shoulders and doing it. There's not a separate mission where you're going to send Cobras cross flot to go do something. Got it. 
little bit different. And so you're at some point you, I guess that it isn't until that. So you do the OBC and then you get your aircraft at the beginning of it because you can, when you go and, and do your advanced aircraft, that's the first time you're getting mixed in, not just with junior second lieutenants and warrant officers, but there are other pilots who are transitioning from one aircraft to another as well. And so yeah. that's the first time you're actually rubbing shoulders with guys and girls who have come in from um, active duty, from real assignments and stuff like that. And are, you know, uh, when I went through, there were still a lot of folks who were transitioning from like Hueys to an advanced aircraft or Alpha Charlies to an advanced aircraft or potentially they were um, Black Hawk folks before, but maybe they're in the National Guard. And so now they're Apache folks and they have to do that. And so that's, that is the, the final phase where you go through and you already have your wings, but that's when you go through your actual transition course. And yeah, you already have your, your wings that are not pounded in. That are not pounded in. And then, uh, so then your first one, you went to Korea first. That's yep, your first. Yep, yep. And so, uh, and that's, that's not a deployment. You're actually living yeah, in Korea yeah. as your unit is there for yep, a couple of years. That's right. That's right. And what the, year is this? So it was, uh, 99, April okay. of 99. So flight school, like I said, I was, uh, I graduated in 97, but then didn't, didn't start flight school till November of 97. So I'm year group 98. You know how that craziness works. So April of 99, I went to Korea and, the and the way that it works when you show up, it's supposed to only be a one year rotation, but as you come in, they always want more junior officers there because they have all the staff jobs and stuff. And so what they'll typically do if you're a junior officer and, uh, you know, for, for an aviator, for army folks in, in general, all you want to do is lead a platoon. That's what you've heard about, right? Your entire four years of college, everything out. I get to be a platoon leader. Well, aviators start later because flight school is so long. Most aviators are already first lieutenants when they come to their unit. And so your clock is kind of ticking on how much time you have left. And so in, in Korea, they used to play to that where you'd come in and they'd assign you as a staff position. And then if you wanted to be a platoon leader, you had to agree to extend for an extra year. Oh. And then you, yeah, yeah. So they would have you over the barrel Bastards. to begin with. And so I did that and it was actually, obviously this is pre 9-11 and Korea was about the closest thing to um, facing a real enemy that was still there, right? And so it's actually a great, back again, back before we were in combat, a great first duty station for a young lieutenant because you're seeing, you know, things in real time and you're having, we, um, while I was there and I'm sure the North Koreans still do, from time to time, they'd send their midget subs down and one of those right. would ground. And so you're going yep. to go look for this soft team that's somewhere in, wow. in South Korea. And so it was, it was very much, it felt like, you know, we had our go to war, um, stocks there and, and you would practice, you know, twice a year, the entire invasion plan for, um, South Korea, if North Korea came across the line. Well, and I remember I was at SEAL Team 5. That was, yes. our, that was our focus back uh, before yep. September 11th. Yep. So we'd yep. go over there and do those exercises. Yeah, yeah. And Full Eagle oh, yeah, and Full all Eagle, those. Yep. Yep. And Seal yep. X, both yep. of those. And uh, the op plan, which I won't, I don't know. Who knows if it's classified or not? So anyway, study yep. that op plan. Yep. And uh, and uh, go over there, and that was our that was our main focus before yeah. September 11th yeah. for my for my first SEAL team. And it was cool as an Apache guy. You had a very unique um, mission that was only Korea specific. In that, um, and and you, I'm sure, obviously know this, but North Korea has the largest soft component of any country in the world, and so they use their soft teams or train them like human cruise missiles. And so basically, this team has a target in South Korea that's like the Ministry of Defense or something. And so their sole mission is to come into South Korea, go take out their target, and then cause as much havoc as they can while they're waiting for There's no exfil plan. They're there until North Korea wins or you track them down and find them. And so the way the, South, the North Koreans would bring those teams in, or doctrinally, is they have those really fast boats. And so they're, they're very small, very maneuverable, very fast. And so when the Navy looked at them originally, they had a problem where, okay, these little boats that North Korea uses, we can't go chase after those with destroyers or stuff. And it's, and they're so small for fast movers, it would be very hard back then to acquire them. So they gave those missions to the Apaches. And so nice. when you would practice the war plan, the first week and a half of the war, you'd go to, it was like Pohang, one of the, the, the marine, uh, rock marine bases on the coast, and you would practice flying missions over water. And so we had Navy lamps birds that would vector you onto target. And then they would, a lot of times the Navy destroyers and stuff, 
would tow targets behind them. And so we'd get to do gun runs on targets out in the water and shoot nice. stuff up and everything. How's that? It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I say it's awesome doing the gun run, but an Apache does not belong over the water, really? over the horizon. Yeah, that's why. The, just because there's something that can go wrong, yeah, there's a place to it's set just down. That's not exactly right. So you, um, well, there's a place to set down. It just happens to be fluid, very fluid and very <laughs> cold, and you're gonna yeah. succumb pretty quickly. In fact, right. it, it was funny. Uh, the emergency procedure you had to brief every time is um, ditching in the water, right? And so you would oh. have to go through and say. Here's what, and one of one of my warrant officers I flew with, we started to do the brief, and he's like, "Sir, we're not going to ditch." And I'm like, I, "I get it, buddy. We're we're not going to ditch, but we have to brief it." And he's like, "No, sir, you don't understand. If we're going down, I'm picking one of these Korean boats, and I'm just landing on it, and we'll sort that out wow. afterwards." Well, what I hate, the ditching thing, like we had to do that too in the back uh, of the helicopter yeah. the dunk Dunker, trainer. Yes. Oh my gosh, uh, I hated that's that. Horrible. Find your what reference point, yep. right? Yeah. So find your reference point, and then yep. just it seems simple. It is. But then you're in this helicopter, for those yep. listening, and there's a fake helicopter over a pool. Yep. And then you put these goggles on that are all blacked out. So like a, a scuba face mask that's yep. all, all blacked out. Yep. And you're just sitting there. And then, boom, it hits the water and it flips upside down. And all of a sudden, everything that you thought you knew as far as, I'm just going to grab this window, <laughs> pull myself over and out. <laughs> totally. Just, I mean, for me, that was so disorienting. Yeah, I, I knew that if I, that happens, like odds of me making it out are about 0%. <laughs> you're still, you can hold your breath for a long oh, time. Oh my gosh, fine. I wish that was true. <laughs> but uh, that was awful. I hated that. Absolutely hated that experience. But uh, and then, did you have to do Seer School too, Army Seer? So the so the Army went back and forth with that. Um, you had a mini Seer School when you finished flight school at Fort Rucker, but it was it 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 was just a kind of an orientation to Seer. So no pounding into the wings, no real mm -hmm. Seer School. Now, having said that, so you could ask to go, and I did ask to go to Seer, but you were always behind the soft guys and the 160th guys and stuff like that. Now, in what's well, very interesting, if you remember um, in the invasion into Iraq, there was an Apache that went down and two guys that were captured. And then Army Aviation realized, like, holy crap, most of our aviators have never been to Seer School. And so since then, they've now opened a Seer School at Fort Rucker that everybody goes through. Nice. And do that, which is what you, which would make sense. But again, the the military usually takes a little time to do that. So yeah, yeah no, no pounding in. No, I didn't get stuffed in any boxes. That's all right. Well, you did get. Uh, <laughs> many, you did go to Afghanistan. I did go to and, Afghanistan. Uh, yeah. Where were you on September 11th? Uh, so I was at. I was uh, the assistant S3. So I was a, a, a junior captain at Fort Hood, and yeah. uh, I remember. We were in the middle of a command and staff, and I remember driving into work, and, and the first reports were like it was a, a small airplane, and the pilot had been misoriented or something like that and crashed in. And I, it took a while for everybody to realize what was actually happening, but we were sitting in command and staff, and the S-1 like burst in, and he's like, another plane just hit, and and then things were were again obviously before the internet or, or very little internet where and i think he even said like the white house was on fire or something like right. that you know right and then everybody's cell phones and and cell phones weren't even a, a big thing then start going off and it was it was crazy fort hood like most posts was completely open until then and so on yeah. september 12th they said hey we're going to close posts so if you have to you know get there early it's going to take some time to do it and i spent I showed up at the main gate at 5.30 in the morning and did not get on to post until almost 11. And it was, you know, because everything, and uh, obviously oh, yeah. you went through that, everything's locked down for the first time. And in, in some ways it was kind of a, a spastic reaction too because every command wanted to be able to show that I'm now doing something for force protection, but we're still not going to trust normal guys and girls with live rounds, right? And so you literally <laughs> at Fort Hood had some poor guy in a road guard vest with an unloaded M16 guarding the commissary. And I'm like, what in the world is this? I know. Senior level leaders just had not been involved in sustained yep. combat operations for so long. Yep. And it was so political. It was just a career. It wasn't a profession yep. for them. It exactly. Was a right. For a lot of them. Exactly. And, uh, right. Yeah. They just couldn't make those uh, those decisions. And they should have been made well ahead of time. I mean, yep. well, I mean, you can look at, oh, we had the coal, you know, yep. almost a, yep. little, a year earlier, uh, yep. the Cobar Tower. We had all sorts of things, little yep. like the embassy bombings, all these things where 
hey, you know, someone thinks they're at war with us. Yep. We're the only ones that don't believe that we're at war here. They've told us twice in fatwas. Yep. And uh, and uh, we better be prepared. And of course, yeah. the wake up call was September 11th. But when did you find yourself then uh, deployed? And was it uh, to Afghanistan first? Yep. yep. So I was at, at Fort Hood at the time. And um, obviously, the 101st guys went in first as, as their aviation and such. And so when I was at Fort Hood, um, as my duty assignment was coming to close, because I was supposed to go to the advanced course now, which is what in the army you go there before you, you take company or troop command. And so you do that school next. And it was right at the point where it looked like we were going into Iraq. But if you remember Turkey kind of, um, shut down at the time, yep. it wasn't letting anybody in. And so I had orders to go and was asking my battalion commander, are we going to war? Are we not going to war? What's, and he's like, Go Put to me the in, coach. Yeah, Put me in. exactly. And he's like, go to the advanced course. I don't think we're going. And I go to the advanced course and then they go anyway. But so I went, I went to the advanced course and then came out in, um, the way at, at the time the Apaches were transitioning from alpha models to longbows. And so the way that worked, the, the best analogy I can use is the alpha model was very much like an analog helicopter. And then the longbow now every helicopter had its own IP address. So, and every helicopter had, it, it was fascinating a change, completely glass cockpits, newer weapon sets. So you had the, um, the uh, RF guided uh, Hellfire missiles instead of just the laser ones. And so the way that the army would do that, it was a significant amount of training that had to happen um, to transition from alpha to longbow. And so you'd go back to Fort Rucker, go through the school, and then the unit itself would stand up at Fort Hood and you'd go through a nine month train up before you would go to your duty station. So I came back and we were a cavalry unit. So I was a company or troop commander, um, took, took command there. We did the nine month train up and then, and we're just waiting like, are we going to Iraq or Afghanistan, Iraq, Afghanistan. And as we were, the unit was based, um, in Germany. And so as we were moving from Fort Hood to Germany, we got orders saying that we were going to go to Afghanistan. And so we came to Germany and it was, it was only, I think a couple of months we had enough to do kind of some shakeout training and stuff like that. And then went to, um, Afghanistan. And what year is that now? So that was 2005. Yeah. And yep. what month is it? It would have been January, I think, of 2005. January or February of 2005. And it was a year-long deployment? Yep, yep, a year-long deployment. So I was the the headquarters um, troop commander, so I wasn't a line troop commander. And so the distinction between it and an Apache battalion or an Apache cavalry squadron, there are three line troops um, which have all the aircraft. So there are, and it's eight aircraft per troop or company. And then there is, and those are Alpha Bravo and Charlie companies. And then Delta company is the maintenance company. And then HHT is the headquarters company. And so it has all the squadron staff and then the, um, like the cooks, the mechanics, the everything that's support that isn't related to, to aircraft maintenance. And so my folks were the ones who went out and set out FARPs. I had, I had, uh, I think it was... 70 or 80 folks scattered across five different FARPs across Afghanistan. And so there, that was a huge focus leading up to Afghanistan because we knew, and I had a fantastic first sergeant who was kind of a force of nature, but he had, because he was an amazing first sergeant, kind of looked out and said, sir, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to have to take E5s and send them alone and unafraid with four or five guys in each one of these locations. And they're going to be, you know, no supervision. No, it's just going to be that E5. Wait, no supervision for an E5? I know. What? I know. I was, uh, Crazy. I was E5 mafia myself for a while. So <laughs> that sounds fantastic. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so it was, that was a big focus of our train up is, is doctrinally, and again, I'm sure doctrine has changed, but it used to be that an Apache battalion or squadron could, could send out a main FARP and then potentially a jump FARP at the same time. But that was about as much as you could do. And we knew we were going to have four or five. And so it was a completely different, um, different way that we'd been employed than any time before. And so that was my job as a commander. And so typically what happens is your more senior commanders are line troop commanders. And then your, your junior guy, uh, the maintenance commander is a separate track because you go to maintenance school. And then your junior guy, Will either it'll be a junior guy or girl who's the headquarters commander, and then they rotate to a line troop, or you take a senior 
line troop commander after they've been in command for a year or something will come back and do that and so originally i i I was like, what am I going to do when we're deployed? Right. Cause my, my guys and girls are all over the place and, and there was not the, the, the usual doctrinal mission, but I was very fortunate in that a very, a, a my best friend was one of the line troop commanders and he helped ensure I made pilot in command before we uh, transitioned over to Afghanistan. And so what I did and, and some of the staff guys did is that we were replacement crews or augment crews for the line troops. And so in Afghanistan, we basically had um, three different missions and that was a ring route support. So it's, you know, the, the helicopters are flying in, in, well, in I remember those color routes with yes, still the color routes. Yes. Then? I remember they were that. still the color routes. I haven't thought about that. And, Oh, uh, geez. I don't know. 15 years or so. So that was eight or nine hours, usually a flying. And most of the time, which I guess you wanted, it was, very boring flying because you're just you know you know just escorting Blackhawks or Chinooks as you're taking in. So that's the first mission set. The second was QRF, where you're basically the 911 force for um, the commander there at Bagram. And then the third mission set was direct direct action stuff. So there were some 160th folks there. Um, they didn't have uh, DAPs there. Didn't have DAPs that were armed, and it was much too high for the little birds. So we would be there the gunship support for the 160th or the SEAL team that was there. Or if we pushed out to any of the, we supported the the Marines down in Jalalabad, their Cobras rotated out. And so we rotated in and provided gunship support and stuff. So if there were direct action missions, we would do that as well. And so a lot of times um, the way we were task organized is that Bagram was a troop uh, plus of Apaches. And then in Salerno, there was, uh, I, I think a troop plus as well, and then uh, a troop minus in Kandahar or something like that. And so when you would, a lot of times, if um, my friend, who was the Bravo troop commander, when he would have to push out and go support a direct action mission, then the replacement crews, people like me and the S1 and stuff like that, would come in and pick up QRF duty or pick up ring route duty or things like that. Is that where you were on uh, for Red Wings? Yeah, exactly. So, um Red Wings was uh, was kind of a, a crazy operation in a lot of different ways because it had started originally as a Marine Corps uh, mission. And then in order to get aviation, there was a whole deal they went through where they where um, the SEAL teams obviously had priority aviation all the time. And so for the Marine Corps to get aviation, then, then the SEAL team said, okay, we will help provide it. Uh, aviation for you, but we're going to take a piece of this mission to go do it. And so it was, it was from my perspective, it was the, the, the planning for it was a little bit kind of hodgepodge and stuff as it, as it came together to begin with. But to be fair, like I was not one of the crews that was um, designated to go support it uh, originally. And then I happened to draw on, uh, on June uh, 28, 2005, I happened to be up for QRF duty. And the way QRF shifts work is that you, um, it was usually a 12 hour shift. And I think it was like zero four to 1600 or something like that. And then the reverse, if you had day or night and I had day and we had, um, when we came in for the mission brief that day, the S3, the operations officer said, hey, look, there are four SEALs um, were inserted like the night before last or something, and we've lost contact with them. And so don't know what that's going to mean or anything yet, um, but stand by and we'll kind of figure out what that what happens. And so when you're on a QRF shift, basically you have the little um, handheld radio and you go about and do your 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 normal job. But if the radio goes off, you have to be airborne within 30 minutes. And so we got the call uh, that morning and, and the way that you do it is the pilot in command would kind of run to the aircraft and get the bird uh, spun up and the front seater would run into the talk and try and get the last minute brief and stuff like that. And so basically he, my front seater was, I fl flew with him quite a bit. He was S1 as well and he was a captain and he, he was a really good stick, really good pilot. And he came back and he said, look, we've got a frequency, a call sign, and a last known grid. That's pretty much it. And so it was uh, he and I and one bird and then my XO and the maintenance officer and another bird. And so we took off from Afghanistan, or uh, Afghanistan, took off from Bagram and flew down to Jabad where we were going to link up with a flight of Blackhawks that had, uh, had a marine QRF element. And how, so, how long of a flight is that? It's about... 
think it was about an hour, hour and a half or something. So it was a pretty decent long flight. And so the, the whole time you don't, you don't really know what's going on, but from our perspective too, I, I remember feeling like dad had finally tossed me the keys to the car, right? Because this is what we do. Like, this is what you sign up to do is to go. And the, the whole point of being a gunship pilot is to support guys on the ground and, and that when the QRF gets activated, it's, it's often a, um, you know, it kind of, kind of makes me laugh sometimes when you hear folks on the news say, Hey, you know, there wasn't a, a talking head will say, you know, we didn't have enough intelligence. We didn't have this. I'm like, that's what a QRF does, right? Like you go into, um, into harm's way when most of the time there is, whether it's a tick or there is usually very, it's unplanned. There's very, usually very little intelligence or anything you know about it and you're just reacting to it. And so, we, we came into Jalalabad to pick up the three Blackhawks. And as I was landing, I, mem- I saw a Chinook with a big refueling probe take off. And those, you know, they're the 160th guys because only the, the 160th folks have those big, long refueling yeah. probes. And I remember seeing him take off. And I'm like, I wonder where he's going. Because that is literally the level of coordination that we had at that point was SEALs are in trouble, launch the QRF, and... I don't know who that guy is or where he's going, but certainly he's not part of my mission or we would have had some kind of coordination or something, right? And so we landed, refueled, um, linked up with the three Blackhawks, and I did, you, you would practice this all the time, you do kind of an ad hoc air mission brief and say, here's what we got. And the intelligence really hadn't changed that much. We had a last known position, a call sign, and um, a radio frequency. And, and so we took off to to head to that last known point and it was it was very very high on the top of the mountain and the reason why that's important is we were the first longbows into afghanistan and the longbow is a much heavier aircraft and we still had the old engines on it so in the summertime when you're high hot and heavy you're very very underpowered and so it, it was a struggle a lot of times when you were uh, escorting chinooks and stuff like that on ring routes they would have to constantly slow down for us that so that we could maintain uh, the pace with them. And there were times where they could just hop over a ridge line or something like that. And we literally didn't have the power to do it. And so, um, as we were getting closer and kind of the weather was coming down, we were, uh, we were, I would call the Blackhawks and say, Hey, you got to slow down a little bit so that we can, we can link up with you. Well, at the same time, as we're closing up in the mountain, I see two Chinooks with the refueling probes coming out and I remember thinking, what, who are those guys? And, and it wasn't, and I, I, there was an A-10 overhead as well that was trying to help uh, provide situational awareness. And I can't remember if he told me they were 160th guys or how he did it, but because they were 160th guys, their fills were slightly off our fills. And so we, we had a hard time even talking For those directly listening, to that's an encryption yeah, fill. Sorry so you about can't, that. Uh, can't talk to one another because why would you? We're already you yeah, know, four yeah, years yeah, into exactly, the war. Exactly. Why would it, you have standard fills across all the different units? And so there were literally points of time where we would have to talk to the A-10 and then he would have to relay it um, to the two Chinooks. And so somehow, and again, it's it's been quite some time. I can't remember how we pieced who they were, but it was the 160th Chinooks with the remainder of that SEAL team and, and, and the folks who were obviously desperately trying to get uh, to their to their brothers who were in harm's way. And then I remember as we were coming in, so the, the doctrinally what happens is as a gunship, you put the aircraft that you're protecting ahead of you until you hit the release point. And then at the release point, what's supposed to happen is you pass the other helicopter and then you go clear the LZ and then you call them in and say either the LZ's hot, in which case you wouldn't call them in, or the LZ's cold, or stand by and loiter while we take care of things at the LZ and we'll call you in. And so I was at the point of pulling abreast the Blackhawks and looking at the 160th Chinooks and saying, we're not going to make it in time for them to, 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 um, before they get to the LZ. We're not, because we're so slow, um, we're not going to be able to make it in time. And so I can't, I can't remember, um, if we were able to talk directly to the Chinooks or had to relay it through the A-10, but I remember saying that and saying, look, you're, you got to wait for us to clear the LZ. We're not going to make it in time. And I remember it coming back where the, the Chinook said, Hey, we're going to go in anyway. You can clear the LZ once you get there. And then, uh, and then that's where kind of tragedy unfolded where the first, um, 
the first Chinook came to a hover and, and as they came to a hover, they got hit by an RPG and, and it went down and it was, it was, um, honestly, like I, at that moment, did you see that or did you hear that? I, I couldn't see it cause it was, I had three Blackhawks on, on my left and I was pulling a beam them on the right and the Chinooks were, um, further ahead. I think it was the A-10 or somebody that called that the, I remember him saying the Chinooks down, the Chinooks down. And the the Blackhawks at that time turned away from the the landing zone and turned into our formation. And it was it was grace of God. There were just helicopters all over the place because the terrain was very very channelized. And so as it was kind of starburst of helicopters going everywhere. And so I ended up rolling over and going down one mountain pass. My my wingman went down another one. The Blackhawks kind of sorted themselves out and um, and started pulling off another one and. And as that's happening, like in your mind, you're just going through the whole, like, this is Black Hawk down and this is happening right now. Like this is, this is happening in front of us. And what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And I remember hearing as I'm literally just flying the airplane at, at that point, because you're, you're so high and the, the valley had turned down was so restrictive. It was all I could do not to fly into the terrain as I'm going back and forth. And I remember wow. one of the Black Hawks hearing it over the radio saying as they pulled off one to another you know they said something like you know what are we going to do and they're they were like we're going to let the apaches do what they do and i'm like that's right that's exactly right this is what we do and so uh, when as as a lot of times kind of when it rains it pours right i I was also having some trouble with my ics cord my my mic cord that plugged into the aircraft and it would it it had been going in and out some of the times. And it's one of those things where you're like, do I want to take my gear in and let them tool with it? Or it's going to be around about that time. It's, it started going out where I could not transmit anymore. Murphy's law. Oh my gosh. Murphy's law. Exactly. And so in the Apache, there's a blast shield that separates the front seater from the back seater. And so you can't even really talk. And so I could hear him and he couldn't, my front seater, he couldn't hear me all the time. And so there's, a period of time where I was literally pounding on the blast shield with one hand and trying to like scribble something on oh my, my kneeboard gosh. and hold it up for him. And it was, it was like the first couple of minutes, I, 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 um, the A-10 after the helicopter went in, rolled in and started firing white phosphorus rockets on either side of the crash site. And, and afterwards talking to him, I think his rationale was he was trying to keep the Taliban off the crash yeah. site. But from our perspective, all we could see, cause we're right on top of the mountain is just, everything is on fire and everything's wow. blown up. And so it literally had to have the A-10 talk me back into my wingman. And so he steered me back in. And so we could, we had enough power to just barely get over the crash site. And so then we spent a couple of minutes trying to figure out where the crash site was because it had, I'd never seen anything like it. And it was just like billowing sheets of fire. And I'm like, surely that can't be, you know, a helicopter, you know, surely that's got to be where the, um, where the white phosphorus rockets hit or something. And so for a time, the A-10 was trying to shine a laser down that we were trying to pick up the spot and follow it down. And then literally he was, what it came down to is he would say, start, turn, stop, turn, left, right, and vectored us over the crash site. And as we went over, like it was, there was, there was nothing there that even, um, resembled the helicopter. And so we, um, we went back and forth, um, several times over and over and over again, trying to figure out if anybody was there, if they weren't at that time, we, we didn't know obviously what had happened to the three other members of the team who were by that time, probably already dead. And, um, and so all we could do is to think we got to keep flying back and forth over the crash site and hope that we see somebody or hope that we can get somebody at the radio. And one of the times as, as we were coming up over it again, it's pretty hard to hit a helicopter with an RPG if you're trying to do a cross shot, cause you're moving at, at probably 120 knots or something like that. And so to, to hit a helicopter, you have to lead them um, pretty well, unless the helicopter's at a hover or you got a shot with it coming straight on. But we were so power limited. There were times when I'm barely doing like 50 knots or something as we're coming over. And as we did it, one of the times a guy popped up and popped an RPG at us. And again, it was, it was grace of God that it missed. And my front seater 
the way that you do it with the Apache is you divide up the weapons between you. And so I had the rocket slave to my eye and my front seater had the cannon slave to his. And so he saw the guy with the RPG as he was shooting and went to fire the 30 at it and the gun hit its azimuth limit. Oh. And so he couldn't shoot back. And it was honestly, it was, it was almost a good thing because you, so I'm sure you, you had the same thing in the seals what you practice over and over again are battle drills and and the reason why you do that is so at moments of extreme stress what you're going to fall back onto is what you have you have trained on over and over and you're going to do react to contact or you're going to do those battle drills and and what that meant for us is you practice over over and over in the simulator where somebody says taking fire and as soon as you hear that you know what to do okay we're going to do evasive actions and i remember a part of it, you're still in the OODA loop as you're going through and trying to get past, you know, the shock of what's happening to you're now in control. And when, when my front seater called out that we were taking fire, it actually broke that log jam for me. Cause then I'm like, okay, now this is familiar. Like I know what we're supposed to do. And it, and that's when like you make the transition from being scared out of your mind to how dare they shoot at us? Like how dare that they, they shoot at us? We're now we're going to bring, you know, fire and brimstone down upon them or stuff. And so when that happened, I came back around, I was like, we're just going to lay rockets down across this entire mountain. And, 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 and at that point you, you feel like, like the, the initiative is shifted that you're going to do it. And as we're coming in for the rocket run, um, my front seater and thank God he said, no, 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 we can't shoot. We can't shoot. There might still be the original team members there. And I was like, you're right. You're right. We still don't know where the four guys are who we thought were still alive at the time. And so the only thing that we could do was to, I took up a higher um, position and my XO and the maintenance test pilot would scream back and forth over the crash site. And we'd try and mark if we were taking fire where it was. And the Taliban are, are you know, by then, even that early in the war, the dumb ones, right? The dumb ones had had been killed, and, and and they were smart enough to even understand our ROE. And and I've seen, I'm sure you've seen the debrief from Marcus and stuff about what he said. But my EXO was screaming by, and he's like, "There's a guy on the side of the ridge line." You look over, and he puts his hands up, and he's got him on top of his head, and you're like, "I think he's a bad guy." I think he's got a weapon. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Which probably it's like an RPG. Been. To me, sir. Exactly. Exactly. But you're, you know, that's, that's what we did is just went yeah. back and forth and back and forth until the weather had come down far enough when we were running out of gas and we had to break station and leave. And the only thing I could think of is that, you know, if anybody's still alive, they're watching us leave right now. And they, and, and it, you know, it just crushed me to think about that. And when Marcus's book came out, he actually writes about that. And he's like, I could see the Apaches and I watched them fly away. And it went from being, what I thought was going to be what I trained my entire life to do to be in the worst day because this, you know, this helicopter that I'm supposed to protect, I can't do anything to stop it. And then we go back and land to go get gas and I haven't even fired a single round. Right. I have, I, you know, we're two gunships who are there who not only do not protect this helicopter, don't find the seals, have not fired a single round because we couldn't identify a target and didn't know where um, where the bad guys were. And so we got back gas again. And at the time, um, the Apaches didn't have high frequency radios. And so our command was back at Bagram and we couldn't talk to them until we got, we came back to Asadabad to get gas. And then our command finally reached out to us and said, okay, you got to, you're going to go back home. And I'm like, and I remember like, and I knew the, the weather was coming down and it was starting to get dark, but one of the, one of the first tenants you learn as a cavalry man is that your job is to gain and maintain contact with the army, with the enemy. That's what the cavalry does. You go out first, you find, and you maintain that contact. And I remember going back, it was somebody who had run out the message to us from Asad, from the talk there at Asadabad and I remember arguing with him, like, go back and tell him, like, we're the only ones who know where that crash site is because the A-10 had had to change off station. There's another one. And they're like, nope, you got to go back home. And, and so we, we refilled at, refueled at Asadabad and flew home. And, and it is, you know, it was the worst, most surreal moment that this is what, 
when when I talk about it, people later, and, and I don't mean to trivialize it, but I, the only thing I can equate it to is almost like spending your entire uh, career as a professional athlete to go to the Super Bowl, and you finally get to go and you fumble the ball, and that's you know what I mean. Like that's that's the thing that you know I took away from that for a long time. It's like that was what I'd spent at that point, you know, seven years of my life preparing to do. And then when it came down to that moment, we couldn't do anything. And it was, it was terrible. It was terrible. And it was, so after that, um, you fly back, you land, you fly back, you land. Um, and as soon as I, I came back, um, one of the exos from one of the other troops is like, Hey, we're going to go, um, run an operation out of J bad where the Marines are going to come up, establish a court on, and we're going to do it. They need more pilots. You're going to go. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And so we went back to Jalalabad to do it. And, and that part was almost comforting because as a U.S. soldier, you hear all the time that, that, and especially, you know, your background from, from as a special operator that, you know, the, the leave no man behind thing that, that your country will not forget you. And they didn't they didn't like the war stopped in Afghanistan for that period until they recovered every single one of those guys. Yeah. And that part was as bad as it was. And is it, it also made you think, you know, if that was me, they wouldn't stop until they came and got us. Yeah. And, and so it was, it was, yeah. And, and they had to, they had to finally bring in like cadaver dogs and stuff like that to find those guys. And it was, it was just, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. And, um, and, and, and that was my one and only time of deploying to combat was that. And I, I came and, and got out of the army, uh, shortly after that. And Have you planned to get out of the army after that or? <sighs> And yeah, what, and let's jump back real quick. What? Yeah. So those next few days, then, did you keep flying missions and support? Yeah. That? So that rescue operation went for a little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, it went for man like a week or two. And so what happened is we we took all the available um, air crews and divided it up into day and night uh, missions. And so my my uh, my best friend, who was the troop commander, his crew took the night missions. I took the day missions. Um, with me and my front senior and some of the replacement crews. And so what we did in the day was basically took the Marines and got them into place as they established the cordon. And then at night when it flipped over and was my buddy, that's when they actually did um, the search to try and go up to the mountain and find those guys. And, uh, and then uh, honestly, I still don't know. I've heard a couple different things on how they actually um, found Marcus. I'd heard, uh, I don't know if we should talk about that, but when when they ended up finding Marcus, um, we were at Jalalabad at the same time planning. Uh, okay, we're going to go in and grab him, and then the I think it was a, um, a an Air Force crew that actually went in and got him instead. And I can't remember how that decision was made or why, but obviously they they eventually went and and got him and recovered everybody else that was there. But it was, you know, one of the things I remember too is, and I can't, again, I, I've never, I've talked to Marcus briefly, like at a book signing. I don't, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him or anything, but I, my recollection was either he was using his um, emergency locator transmitter off and on, or somebody was because the entire time, or somebody had, had found one of the, right. the, the fallen guys and was yeah. using that radio. Because as you're flying missions, there's A-10s that are overhead constantly. And, and they were transmitting over and over again in the clear saying, Marcus, we're coming for you. Or, you know, and they didn't yeah. obviously use his name. But I remember flying one of the missions, listening to the A-10. And I then can't, I can't remember the call sign they used. But the A-10 pilot was said, if this is not call sign we will find you and we're going to kill you and nice. it was you know and it was and it wasn't it didn't come across it maybe it sounds kind of like bravado or something now but at the time that's all i could think about it's like man if he if he's listening to that he knows that we're going to come and get him yeah you know yeah. and that was and that was like as hard as it was that's what you you kept thinking like even though at that point they were pretty sure that there was only one guy that was there 
they were going to move heaven and earth until yeah. they got that guy. Yeah. And it and it was a very comforting thing as a service member to see, right? That your your country is not going to forget you. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Dark day. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Man, and then, I didn't know where we you're going. <laughs> hey, no, no, man. I appreciate you sharing that. <laughs> you know, and um, yeah. I mean, what a uh, it was involved in. It was, and that certainly informed, obviously, a lot um, in my book because what what I spent. When you're in the military, I think everybody's got, you know, especially in, after that that long being in combat, everybody has horrible stories, and it's just, and it's just the thing that you have. But what when I got out of the army, I left from Germany and ETS and went back home to work at GE, and so you you go from being surrounded by this group of people who understand and who have been through that and have similar stories to now. You know, I'm I'm in a spot where nobody but else was in the military or had been or had any idea what you were going through. And I think for me, that's when it finally, you know, that's that's the first time, especially when and when you're still in the military, maybe you don't, also don't have time to process all of that and to think through it and to think. And for me, part of it, too, was like a almost a sense of purpose thing. Like, what in the world am I ever going to do? with my life that will be as important as that day or that, you know, that five minutes that you can't ever get back. And now I'm sitting in a cubicle doing what, like what, what in the world is ever, is ever going to be that important. And I think some of the reason why I had a guy I was talking to that was a former 160th colonel that I was laying the stuff out for him. And I told him, you know, after, after I left GE, I went in the FBI for a while and was a SWAT team guy and stuff. And he's like, you know, you think you were chasing that again? And I, I wouldn't have ever put it in that words, but I almost think like you're looking for a chance to be significant again. Right. Yeah. Or, or it's like, God, give me another chance. And this time I won't screw it up. You know what I mean? Well, you didn't screw it up, obviously. <laughs> yeah. It's combat, and that's what happens. You know, it's chaos. It's, it's craziness. It's insanity. And you do the best you can with the information yeah. you have available. And, uh, and that's all you can ever yeah. do. Or anyone, any, that's all anyone can ever expect of you. Um, so, yeah, obviously, there's nothing. There's right. nothing you can do anything wrong in any of that, obviously. Uh, to, uh, and it's obvious to anybody that's, that's listening, too. Um, but yeah, when you make that transition, it's like, how are you going to replicate that, that yeah. situation again ever? Well, exactly. it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, but you, but you can't, when you're 30 something years old, like you can't accept that yet. And I had, I had got to meet Mike Murphy's mom and dad and oh. his dad, while I was at GE, there was a, a local author there in Cincinnati that wrote the seal of honor book. And we had, um, a veterans network at GE and it was Memorial day and the book had just come out and I'm like, let's bring them in and bring the family. And it was, it was, it was pretty amazing. And his dad was awesome. Like his dad, wow. Dan Murphy was a Vietnam, um, era infantry, uh, platoon leader who also had a purple heart who also, and I remember getting up to introduce him and I couldn't even like make it through the introduction. And this guy who had lost his son, you know, walks up on stage and, and he's comforting me. And it was wow. just like, just an incredible guy and an incredible family. And, uh, he invited Ange and I, my wife and I to actually come up and see the christening up in Maine when they did it and stuff. But it was, it, you know, and it's, and I think it's as a, um, as a veteran, and this is what I tell folks too, like, there was nothing that he said or people later on when I worked at a company I worked at was almost all folks who were former um, special operations guys. And one of the founders of the company, his name is Nate Self, um, was the Ranger QRF um, leader during the whole Tarka Gars thing. And so he had, you know, another helicopter shot down on another side of a mountain trying to rescue another SEAL. And he wrote a book about it called Two Wars and what you know, what had messed him up so badly about it is that after his helicopter crashed and he secured the landing zone and he had guys that were very seriously wounded, they would not send another helicopter until it was nightfall because obviously, you know, guys from however many thousands of miles away are command and controlling it. And they're looking at, we've already had two helicopters shot down. We're not going to do it again. And so he lost guys that could have been saved 
because they wouldn't send another helicopter and there was nothing he could do about it. And like, and so, you know, what do you do with that? How do you, and so he, you know, talked to me about it and said, Hey, you know, it wasn't your fault exactly what you said. Right. And there was nothing magic about his words, but the fact that he had been there before and done it. And I think that's the powerful thing as veterans or as is that you can, you can speak into somebody's life and having been there, having gone through that and, and, and say those same words, but say it from a perspective of, of having lived through that and say, you know, it wasn't your fault. You know, there was nothing else you could do. And there's nothing magic about those words, but I think there is something powerful come from it when somebody who has that experience says those to you. And I think, you know, my front seater, I went in the FBI and, and did whatever. He left aviation and went and became an ODA team leader. And, no kidding. And, yeah. And, and so did the same thing. And, and he was every June 28th, we text each other. And for years, he was going through the exact same thing I was. And we never talked about it to each wow. other. We never talked about it to each other about it. And he's, and he's like, you know, he's, he's out of the army now and doesn't do it. But he's like the same thing where he's like, I'm looking for part of the reason why he went to go be an ODA team leader is looking for a chance to do it right this time, right? Like to get that do over, to go back and grab that moment in time and have it turn out differently. And there's no way for that to happen. And you know that, but then it still doesn't stop you from, Hey, I'm going to do one more mission or I'm going to do one more thing. And maybe somehow it'll balance out this time and it'll be done. You know what I mean? Oh, and yeah. it makes no sense sitting here talking about it, but you can, it makes perfect sense when, when you're, when you're in the moment or when you're trying to work through that. Yeah. And then what you're going to do now is, uh, someday someone's going to come to you yep. that has a similar experience exactly. and you're going to have that benefit of what uh, has now turned into wisdom yep. to be able to talk to them through their experience yep. and, uh, just the way somebody did to you. So, exactly um, right. and that's, yeah, that's the power of being able to reach out and the power of wisdom. So that time, yep. uh, that experience that, uh, that, uh, then, that you turn that into wisdom to pass on yep. to the next guy coming up. So, yep. um, man, incredible being involved yeah. in that sort of thing. But, uh, uh, thank you for, for yeah. sharing it. It obviously informs sure. your, your writing. It makes the, it does the, it huge. Book, uh, you know what it is. Yeah. makes those emotions come from the, come out of those pages and out of those words. Yeah. I think, I think there were two, when I was writing somebody a lot smarter than me said that in a good novel, the writer is trying to work out a question for themselves on the pages. Right. And so part of my question or part of that influenced me, obviously, was what, what happens when, you know, what was supposed to be your defining moment isn't? And, and, and how do you live with that? And how do you, how do you, how do you, number one, keep going on? But then number two is, is, is there something after that? Is there or what, you know, what I did with my protagonist is kind of gave him the opportunity to go back to in, in my book, it's Syria where he lost an asset in his family, but it's, Hey, I'm going to go back and atone for this. And you can't, there's no way to atone for it. But I think a lot of times you got to figure that out for yourself. Right. And that was part of it. And then the other part of it, like I said, was one thing was listening on that day, watching the war stop and be completely focused on these guys that were lost. And, um, at the same time, I had I had the privilege of becoming very good friends with a former um, Delta operator whose first tour of duty was um, Gothic Serpent as he came out. And and he, he talked me through and he said, you know, part of the reason why we were on those helicopters for so long that once the, the Black Ops crashed is because we would not leave until we'd recovered everything from our, you know, every forensic piece from our fallen. And, and to think about that, like who in the world besides the America does that? Like who right. in the world would say, we, you know, we know these guys are dead anyway, but we are not leaving them here yeah. no matter what it costs us. And that, that's still just, and, and I think if people who aren't from your background or haven't seen that don't understand. And, you know, it's, it's epitomized in part of it in the Ranger Creed. And so that's part of what I wanted to show with my book is what does, what does that look like in real life? What does that look like when you have somebody who is part of that fraternity that says, hey, if I go there, 
I know that you're not going to leave me, yep. you know, and I know that you are going to move heaven and earth to come get me. And so that, that was a huge, a huge part of what influenced writing my book. Well, that's why it's so, uh, so powerful. And I, uh, I was fortunate enough to read, a, read an early copy and blurb it. And uh, I know it's going to be a, a huge success oh, and uh, coming out in March. Right? Yep. Yep. And, March uh, 3rd. So, so I'm excited to get it out there and get yep. you out there in front of everybody. And that's why it's going to be so powerful. You can tap into those experiences yep. and, and take the emotions behind them and apply them to a fictional narrative um, that's inspired by something that more than just an idea. Absolutely. So, uh, so I'm super fired up for you. Thanks. And uh, do you think that, um, so you glossed over the, a, a fairly interesting part of the story, <laughs> like, oh, I just went to the FBI and did SWAT stuff. <laughs> like, uh, like, who does that? That's pretty, it's uh, amazing. So you, you make the transition, you're at yep. GE, yep. You're, I'm guessing you're fairly miserable in the cubicle. Fairly miserable in the cubicle. And then you decide, hey, do you talk yeah. to your wife and say, hey, you, well, I think I'm doing this other thing, uh, FBI, but not just a, yeah. you know, I'm not just going to be an agent. I want to go to the, go to SWAT or wherever you. I don't think she knew all of that at the time. <laughs> Um, she did know that was probably some of the, the hardest, I was at GE for three years and it was probably the hardest three years in our marriage because we had, we were high school sweethearts. We had both, our families were both there. That was supposed to be, I was done doing crazy things. We were going to have a normal life and, and everybody was happy, but me, everybody else had a normal life and everybody else was fine with me. And I kept thinking, I'm like, this can't be it. Like this can't be, um, this can't be my life that I pull into the same parking lot for the next 20 years. And I, and at, at that time I too was, like I said, I was still working through the red wing stuff a lot. And I would, I would spend a lot of time because I didn't know most of those guys. Like I had met um, Christensen once I, we'd come over to the seal compound to talk to him once about a mission that we were doing but i wasn't a normal line crew so i didn't work with him a lot and i remember christensen i remember one one or two and it was like i felt like it should mean something more to me that this this horrible thing happened i didn't even know who those guys were and so like i i was spending time just trying to figure out everything i could about their bios or or just oh. online like reading about the memorials and trying to figure out because i'm like you know, it should be, I don't know. It doesn't, I guess it doesn't even make sense, but it was like, I should almost like you think like I should suffer more for this than, than, than what I am. And so I knew that I could not, I could not stay at GE and I could not just, you know, turn that side of me off and be done with it. And so I did. I applied to probably every three letter agency there was I did. And my wife was awesome. And she, she knew that there was something probably that was still broken with me and it was not going to get fixed where I was. And so the FBI at the time had uh, what they called their tactical recruiting program where they were looking for folks with combat experience in both um, guys like you who they could take and put into the, the pipeline for HRT to come assess and then certainly pilots and stuff as well. And so I did that. And um, because, you know, I, because of my background and stuff, I kind of got fast tracked through it. And so it went pretty quickly and we were, I was actually an, an agent here in Dallas. And um, so you went fairly quickly. I mean, you get accepted, you get a time to start at the Academy. Yeah, it's still you go to Quantico. Uh, yep. Yeah. 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 And so are you the, flying for them or are you? So, so I wasn't, I was, it seems it, like that would be a better use of resources. <laughs> um, but so that's what was the government, supposed I'm not surprised to happen. No, 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 no. It wasn't the government's fault. What was supposed <laughs> to happen is that after I did my initial two years as an agent is that I would come here in back, Dallas, here in Dallas is that I would come back and assess for HRT and come be a pilot. Um, when I got to Dallas, I was very fortunate and got assigned to the human squad and it was a lot of fun. And, it, and so my job was to run and recruit sources and I got to go to any particular focus. Like, yeah. Mainly foreign intelligence, counterintelligence stuff. So nice. I got to go to some, some really neat training and stuff to say, here's how you specifically are going to target the folks that, and so it, it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. And, um, and I felt like I was living a Tom Clancy novel or something, right? And like, this is my life. And then at the same time, they were, so the individual field offices have um, SWAT teams, but they're not full-time um, gigs unless it's a really big field office like New York, I think has a full-time one and stuff. And so 
um, was fortunate enough that, you know, the, the team had tryouts and they need guys because I'm not you. I'm not a ninja. I was an Apache pilot. And so <laughs> they needed guys and I had worked hard enough to do it and, and made SWAT team. And it was, um, it was a lot of fun. And again, I was a junior guy on there. I had very Im- important jobs like to, uh, I think we're getting waved off. Private but. event coming in <laughs> six minutes. In six minutes. At six. Okay. Oh, at six. All right. Yeah, I wonder if we can pick that up and go somewhere. Cause I want to hear more about FBI. <laughs> you know what we're going to have to do? We might have to do a part two. Yeah, yeah. We should do that. Maybe I actually got to uh, go uh, pick up my wife in about an hour or so. But yeah, I'd love to do a part two so with let's you. Let's do part two. Let's do okay. part two and we'll, we'll pick up with... Uh, with FBI, Tom yeah, Clancy, because yeah. I was going to ask you all about the training for that. Like, <laughs> it, is it different for each field office? Is it in-house? And you don't have to answer right now. We're yeah, let, yeah, let yeah. People, this is a uh, teaser. This, this is a teaser yeah. for the next one. We're going to cover yeah, FBI. I we're going to cover counter just intel. started this. Like, and, I feel uh, like you and Oprah. <laughs> you guys have the couch. Right and, there. You know, That's it. <laughs> crying like a little girl over here. Uh, so, and no, just, no, uh, I appreciate yeah. you sharing all that with with everybody. And we'll come back. We'll talk about, we'll do it right before the novel comes out in March. We'll talk FBI stuff, training, all the rest of it and the journey into publishing yep. but uh without sanction it comes out march, march 3rd. 3rd march 3rd so yep. super fired up about that we will do this again thank Absolutely. you so much for uh for doing this and talking to me it's, uh, yep. it's an honor to talk to you thank you for your time in uniform and yes, everything well. that you've done for this uh for this country and uh and you uh, you have nothing to be ashamed of only no, things to be proud you. of so um thank you so much yep we'll talk soon thanks jack thanks, brother thank you for tuning into the danger close podcast an ironclad original presented by Six Hour. You can find out more about Don Bentley at donbentleybooks.com. Be sure and follow him on the social channels there and pre-order your copy of Hostile Intent today. You can follow me at Jack Carr USA on the social channels at officialjackcar.com. And you can go to Jack Carr USA for the merch. My next novel, In the Blood, is available for pre-order right now. And if you like the conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for tuning in. Take care, stay safe, keep fighting. (laughs) 